So before we look into more advanced simulation capabilities, I'm going to go into much more detail about the various system options and how they affect the simulation or the operation of the motor simulator. Now you'll notice that when I hover my mouse over any of these drop-down menus, it generates a detailed tooltip that explains what that drop-down selector is, uh, and it's important to read that if you're not sure what the functionality is. Um, and we're just going to start off from the top and work our way down every one of these drop-downs with a detailed explanation on how they affect the motor simulation. So the first off, of course, is the motor choice. Now when we first created our first simulator, we just had three models of Crystallite motor. It was a really simple drop-down list. Since that time, I've built several more motor dynamometers and characterized hundreds of different hub motors over the years and gradually added them to this database of motor models. Now this initial list shows only the motors that Grin actively sells or has sold in the past. If you want to see all the additional motors that we've modeled, click the Show All button right at the bottom. That will populate not only the motors that we sold, also a bunch of sample motors that we've ordered over the years and for re one reason or another did not decide to offer them on our store page. So here you can see things from BMC motors, you can see motors that were proprietary like the Bionics motors, um, and you can see motors like the Akima AKM motor that are compelling but not motors we decided to list in our catalog. Um, and, uh, and there's a whole slew all the way down. Uh, it also includes even some electric skateboard motors. Uh, the skate numbers here refer to those. Um, there is also a custom motor option where you could input your own motor model parameters. Details of setting that up are going to be the subject of another video. That's quite an advanced thing to do. Uh, but in the meantime, know that most of the motors you can envision are either modeled here or there's a very similar analog. So if you have a large direct drive motor, it might not be Muxus, but any motor with a 45 millimeter stator core and that common 205 millimeter diameter could be approximated with this motor. Uh, right under that, there's an option for hub motors or mid drives. So when you choose a hub motor, the simulator is assuming that the output RPM of the motor matches the RPM of the wheel, where you set your wheel diameter. When you choose the mid-drive option, you have an option to change that gear ratio. You can set the efficiency of the drive chain, and you can choose the mid-motor being geared to the front chain ring, and then you have a front chain ring that goes to a rear chain ring on the back, and those gear ratios and efficiencies are added to the overall simulation output. The battery selection drop-down uh, has two pieces of information. Of course, there's the nominal battery voltage as well as the battery capacity. Most of the batteries, again, that we've sold, we've listed in this drop-down list. And we've also had some fairly common uh, generic batteries, like a 12-volt lead-acid battery back in the day was a very common choice. Um, there's not a huge difference. If you simulate between different 36-volt battery types, you'll see that there's very little change to the curve. But there is a slight change. And you can see that as I change between these, you see how the shape of the curve changes over there. And that's because different battery packs have different internal resistances. So a battery with a high internal resistance will have more voltage sag. And you can illustrate this right now. If we see what is the voltage of the battery um, at the uh, crossover point, well, this battery is at 37 volts. That's my 26 amp hour pack. So that's a very high capacity battery, so it will have low internal resistance. If we chose a 12 amp hour nickel metal hydride battery, well, those batteries had higher internal resistance. And you see the voltage is now 34.9 volts instead of 37 volts, so the whole system will perform with a bit less power and speed. Um, you can, as with the motor, create a custom battery. So in a custom battery, you explicitly say what is the open circuit voltage of the battery. So this would let you mod simulate, say, a flat battery that's at 32 volts. If you want to know how's the system going to perform when the battery is almost empty, you could put that to low. If you want to see, well, how does it perform fresh off the charger, then the battery might be 41 volts. Um, and you can see quite a substantial difference. Um, let me go back to a 0% grade. So here we could simulate a flat battery. So a flat battery might be 32 volts. And we can see what our performance would be when it's flat, 29 kilometers an hour. And we can compare that to how fast it would be going when the battery is hot off the charger, when it might be 41 volts. Continue, stimulate, and you see quite a difference in the speed and power. The third major selection choice here is the motor controller. Now we've got a number of controllers in the drop-down list. Initially, we were selling uh, Infineon-based motor controllers. And these are PWM throttle controllers, uh, 20, 25 amps, 35 amps, and 40 amps were the four models that we used to sell. 
Uh, and in a PWM throttle controller, when you vary the throttle, you're more or less varying the speed, uh, the voltage of the motor controller, and that affects the speed quite directly. More recently, we've switched over to field-oriented controllers, and these ones, the throttle's controlling the torque of the motor, or it's controlling the phase current of the controller, um, and that would be the base runner and the Franken runner and the phase runners. Now, with the base runners, Franken runner, and phase runners, you notice that we simulate both a cold and a hot option. And that's because these controllers have an internal thermal rollback. As the controller gets hot, it limits how many amps it can deliver to the motor, and that reduces the torque that you can get out of the system. Um, as with all the other things, we provide a custom controller option. So when you choose a custom controller, you're explicitly stating the maximum battery current. Generally speaking, if you order a controller that's a 10 amp or a 15 or 20 amp controller, it's referring to the battery current. It's not the current from the controller to the motor. That is the phase current limit. Now, many controllers don't have a phase current limit. They only have a battery current limit. All the early Crystallite controllers, the earlier Infineon controllers, generally behave this way. Um, and the controllers also have an internal resistance. Much like a battery cell has an internal resistance, there's resistance of the wiring from the controller to the motor, and there's resistance of the MOSFETs inside the motor itself, um, inside the controller itself. Uh, and finally, controllers can have different throttle responses. So a voltage throttle is what you see on most generic motor controllers, where half throttle means the motor spins at half RPM. A torque throttle is what you see in most newer controllers and field-oriented controllers. And there, a half throttle means half torque. It'll still spin up to the same speed, but the peak torque is going to be half as much. Um, this has a substantial effect on the shape of this curve when you're riding at partial throttle. That's the subject of a more detailed dive a bit later. Okay, and then the throttle percentage is something that we had already discussed. Um, so the throttle slider here shows you at what percent throttle you're simulating. If I have a controller with a voltage throttle, well, as I drag the slider, you can see the shape of the curve is such that the speed, the maximum speed, scales with my throttle. If I was to have a controller Let's do a custom controller, and I'll change that to be a torque throttle rather than a voltage throttle. Now, as I scale this down, you see my top speed doesn't change, but the torque curve shifts substantially at lower speeds. So advanced we're going to cover in individual details later. Uh, so now we're going to talk on the vehicle parameters. So this is characterizing the vehicle on which the motor system is mounted. The wheel circumference needs no explanation. Uh, if you want to be really precise, you can enter a custom wheel diameter. Otherwise, we have all the standard nominal wheel sizes with the typical size tire that you would have. Um, the vehicle type is capturing both the air drag and the rolling resistance. The numbers here, uh, this is something that can vary substantially. You wear a big puffy jacket or you wear a t-shirt and you're going to have a different air drag profile. Uh, if you have wide tires or skinny tires, that affects the air resistance. The pressure on the tires affects the rolling resistance. These options that we have are ballpark figures that roughly capture a specific style of bicycle. But if you know more details or want to play around with very specific vehicles, you can customize the drag coefficient, air drag coefficient profile, as well as the rolling resistance. And people modeling velomobiles or people who really understand the nature of vehicle aerodynamics can use the simulator tool to study that vehicle performance in there. Uh, the weight, as already discussed, is simply the total weight of the vehicle, rider, batteries, the whole shebang. And the human power is how much power is coming from the rider's legs. Changing the human power doesn't change the shape of the motor curve at all, but it does change the speed that you'll attain. If you ever set this to zero watts, you'll see that the cursor position for the predicted steady state speed is always right where the motor power crosses the load power of the bicycle. As soon as you add human power, you'll see that the cursor moves to the right, so that the difference of the motor power and the load power is equal to the human power. So move that to 200 watts, and it'll shift further to the right. And finally, of course, is the percent grade. Uh, and this is just the steepness of the slope that you're climbing or going down. So you can simulate uh, downhill riding as well. You'll see that when you have a negative grade, the load line actually goes negative. So it takes uh, the gravities, rather than adding to the load, it's actually supplying power to the load. And you can always type in a numeric value if you have something very specific to enter. 
um, or if you want to go outside the range of what we allow, which I think tops out at 20%, but there's nothing saying you can't simulate climbing a 25% hill. So next up, we have a separate box with the chart options. So the x-axis units is very straightforward. Uh, people in the United States may choose to do everything in miles per hour, and that simply changes this to be a miles per hour rather than a kilometer per hour axis. When you're dealing with mid-drive systems, or if you're looking at other aspects of the motor simulation, you may want to show RPM on this axis instead. So in this case, you're seeing not the speed of the vehicle in distance covered, but the speed of it in terms of wheel RPM. Now the next option is a selection of what the blue curve does. So the blue line on our graph, as we explained, is the torque of the motor. You start off with a high torque, and as the wheel increases in speed, you see the torque decrease, and then it decreases more sharply once we're no longer at the battery current limit of the uh, simulation. Um, we also give the option to show that in terms of pounds thrust. So the difference between torque and thrust, now you notice that the shape of the curve doesn't change at all if I'm in terms of torque or pounds thrust. Um, but when you switch to a smaller size wheel, you're not changing the torque of a motor. It's one of the most common misnomers used in e-bikes saying, oh, get to a smaller wheel so you get more torque. You don't get more torque. The diameter of the wheel has no bearing on the motor torque. But what happens is that a smaller diameter wheel generates more forwards thrust for a given torque. So if you wanted to actually compare wheel sizes and understand that in a unit that makes more sense, you can switch this to be a measurement of pounds of thrust. Now if I'm in pounds thrust and I change from a 20 inch wheel to a 26 inch wheel, you see here we peaked at 65 pounds of thrust. If I increase that to the 26 inch wheel, now I only have 50 pounds of thrust. If I went to a 29 inch wheel, now I only have 45 pounds of thrust. So you can more readily appreciate the effect of wheel size in this pounds thrust representation. If I was back to showing this in newton meters, as I change my wheel size, you see it's 75 newton meters. It doesn't matter what diameter wheel I have, the thrust, the torque of the motor is always going to be 75. Final option here is the black line. Now we've shown, uh, we've pointed out all along that the black line here is the power needed to move the vehicle. Um, when you're climbing a steep hill, it power goes up more or less directly proportional to your speed. But when you're riding on flatter ground, you end up with mostly a parabolic curve. Here the power is mostly fighting against air drag, and the air drag force increases at your square of your velocity, so that gives this quadratic curve. There's also an option to show the percent grade here. This is a really useful advanced capability if you're trying to understand how the system performs over different grades of hill. And when you choose percent grade, it's not showing how much power is needed to move the vehicle. Instead, it's showing what is the grade hill that you'll be able to climb at steady state. So now as I drag this cursor around, you can see that at 10 kilometers an hour, I would be able to climb a 21% grade hill. At 5 kilometers an hour, I could climb a 32% grade hill. And if I'm going at 25 kilometers an hour, you can see I'm only able to climb a 5% grade hill. So this gives you that direct relationship of how, how much you'll slow down for any given steepness of hill. Now you see that if I go really, really slow, I can climb almost anything. Here I'm climbing a 92% grade hill. And that's because at low, low speeds, any amount of human power can climb anything, right? As long as you're geared down sufficiently, 200 watts will keep you climbing. If you're to simulate a setup with no human power, then you can get an idea of what is the maximum grade hill you can ever climb without the motor stalling out, without you pedaling. And you can see here, that's a 25% grade um, though it would, of course, overheat in minutes. Um, but that is a really useful option for people who are trying to understand that relation between speed and how steep of a hill they can climb.